I, I work for Vercel, and someone of you may already know Vercel. We are the creators of Next.js, and our platform supports over 35 plus front end frameworks, including Redwood. Um, so, today, I'd like to talk to you about your journey, or the journey that your data takes from your database to your front end application, specifically in React 18. And I'm curious to know, please put your hands up, how many of you used or use React? OK, most of you. <laughs> what about Next.js? Wow, that's amazing, cool. So you probably already know this, but a few months ago, React 18 was released. And it introduced new concurrent features. And on the React blog, the team itself, they mentioned that Concurrent features will have a big impact on the way that developers build applications. So I want to discuss with you how concurrent features, as well as React server components, will impact the way we build applications and what that means for frameworks like Next.js and, of course, Prisma. Now, I'm going to specifically look at routing and how it impacts data fetching and rendering, because I think they're kind of like the pillars of front-end applications, if you think about it. Now, before we jump in, I want to share with you a very short story. I learned how to code through a boot camp. And I spent nine months learning about the front-end and the back-end. We started off with you know, basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and of course, React. And once we were confident we could build very simple front-end applications, then we moved on to the back-end. And in the back-end, we learned how to spin up very simple node servers. And I remember one particular team project where we had to use Express and middleware to manage the back-end routing and create our API routes. And we had to manually update our schema. So we used a query builder to do our SQL queries. And then we had to use another tool to preview our database. And then back on the front end, we used a global Redux store to fetch our data and store it so that we could pass it around our application. Now, I don't want to bash on any of these tools. I was definitely misusing them due to my lack of experience. But as you can all probably imagine, it was very difficult for someone who was new to coding to understand the data flow from the database to the back end, to the front end, and of course, finally, to the components. And although there was a very clear distinction between front end tools and back end tools, the journey of the data was very convoluted. I mean, if you think about it, I had to learn so many different tools just to create a very basic CRUD app. And because there were no conventions, whenever I started a new project, we had to take a different approach to routing and then another different approach to data fetching. Now, fast forward a few months, and I made two discoveries that really changed my workflow. And what I loved about them is that I could finally get past trying to glue everything together, trying to debug everything, and actually build applications. And the first one was, of course, Next.js. The data fetching methods in Next.js gave me a very structured place to fetch data within my application. And with the API routes, it also meant that I didn't have to create a separate backend. One thing that I also loved about Next.js was the file-based system, which meant that routing was way more intuitive than you know, using code. So I didn't really need two routers, one for the backend and one for the frontend. Now, the second revolution to my workflow was, of course, Prisma. And Prisma provided a very declarative way to model my database, query my database, and preview my database. And in my previous workflow, those three things were separate. But if you think about it in retrospect, it kind of made sense to combine them. Now, with Prisma and Next.js, the journey of my data became much simpler. Now, I hope I'm not selling it too much. I do love both of these tools. But the takeaway that I want to, <laughs> to tell you today is that there is value in abstractions and conventions. 
not just for new learners, but also for more experienced developers and their teams, to enable them to work faster and also more consistently. And secondly, sometimes new innovations, new tools, they kind of tend to blur the line between what we considered a solid boundary before. So when we use these tools, we kind of almost have to shift our mindset on how we build applications. But anyways, going back to React 18 and React Server Components, I believe that a shift in mindset is going to be, ha be happening very soon as we adopt these new features. You see, for a very long time, there was a very clear distinction between single-page applications on the client, which React is associated with, and multi-page applications on the server. But there is an emerging trend in our industry, and it's not just with React. We are seeing front-end frameworks moving towards more hybrid solutions that leverage both the client and the server. So in early 2020, uh, the members of the React team, they were publicly discussing moving more rendering work to the server. The idea was that if we have to go to the server anyways to fetch data, could we do some of the rendering work while we're there and therefore reduce the amount of code that we send back to the client? Now, you can probably imagine the hot takes that follow that tweet, and they can be summarized as, this looks a lot like traditional server-side rendering, you know, a pendulum swing back to MPAs. But to quote a not-so-serious meme from one of my favorite people on Twitter, this is less of a pendulum swing and more a spiral of incremental improvements or switchbacks. We're not looking for purely SPA or purely MPA, but we want to combine the benefits of both the client and the server. So each time this conversation was brought up on Twitter, the React team was careful to emphasize that they were looking for a hybrid solution. And I think an important takeaway here is that this hybrid solution wouldn't be creating additional requests to the server. It would take advantage of a request that already has to exist anyways. So in December 2020, the React team gave us an early Christmas present that would enable frameworks to move more towards hybrid solutions. And that was React Server Components. When you combine React Server Components with features like suspense and streaming, we have the primitives or the building blocks to address some of the disadvantages of multi-page applications while maintaining the user experience of single-page applications with which we come to love. But there is one last piece to the puzzle. In the last few months, the Next.js Next team has been considering if we need to go to the server to do data fetching, and now with React server components, we are going to the server to do some rendering, could we also use the same round trip to do some routing? Could we enable developers to build hybrid apps where data fetching, rendering, and routing happens where it makes more sense for the app that they're building? And could we do it with easy conventions that will allow them to shift the work back and forwards between the client and the server? So, a few weeks ago, we shared an RFC. And in this RFC, we proposed a new router that builds on top of React server components and React 18 features. There is a lot more detail in the RFC, and if you're curious, I would recommend um, reading it to know more. But for now, let me just share with you some of the things that I'm excited about. So with React Server Components, we can interweave client components and server components in a tree, meaning that in your page or you, in your route, in your application, you could potentially have client and server components. And if you think about it, with this model, it becomes increasingly important to break up flat routes into smaller fragments, or as we like to call them, route segments. And these route segments, they map to your components and to your URL segments. And although we are breaking up the routes, we want to maintain file system routing because generally, it's more of an intuitive way for developers to define routes. And breaking up these routes into small segments has three benefits. The first one is that we're able to create layouts. And layouts has been a very, like, very requested community ask. And we are defining a layout as UI that can be shared across sibling routes. 
And these layouts shouldn't re-render or lose state on navigation. This also means that for components that don't change when a user navigates between a route, those components should also remain interactive. And secondly, if we're combining the we are combining this model of nested routing with server components. It means that on navigation, we only have to fetch and re-render the segment that's changed, and we don't have to re-render the whole tree. And thirdly, we can have more granular control over data fetching by allowing each segment to fetch its own data. Since we already moved data fetching out of sight of um, your rendering code or your components uh, with the Next.js data fetching methods, we can eagerly initiate those requests in parallel. This helps minimize waterfalls, and overall, it reduces the amount of time that it takes to fetch and render the content for the routes. And overall, by building a new router with React server components, we're able to reduce the amount of work that the server has to do on navigation, the time it takes to do that work, and also the amount of code that gets sent back to the client. And by combining it with concurrent features, such as transitions, suspense, and also the future off-screen component, we can simplify loading states and improve the navigation experience. So for example, if you're using client-side routing to do data fetching, and you're fetching as you render, you may have too many staggered loading states. And you want to consolidate those loading states into like a fewer, more meaningful loading UI. On the other hand, if you're using server-side routing, you have to fetch and render the content before navigation starts. So your application will appear unresponsive while the work happens on the server. In that case, you might want to add loading UI to show that the work is being done. And we can improve the navigation experience by pre-rendering a small, meaningful part of the future screen. This means that when the user navigates to a new route, it, the navigation will be in immediate, whether that's client-side routing or server-side routing. And then we can show something like a cover photo or a title while the rest of the content loads. And in a similar fashion, and this is one of my favorites, is that we'll be able to stash routes in the future. So any routes that have been visited can be stashed, and then we can pre-render routes before they are visited. So that when the user navigates back th backwards and forwards between those two routes, the navigation will not only be instant, but we can also store the state and show, restore the state, sorry. <laughs> Now, if routing, data fetching, and rendering are the pillars of front-end applications, then I want to argue that URLs are kind of the foundation of it. If you think about it, the web has something unique, which is the ability to link to almost every single piece of content on any device, with any browser. And we want to provide simple conventions that doesn't just make it easier for developers to implement great UI patterns, but also embrace the web for what it is. That also doesn't break URLs. So for example, in a route, you should be able to have one or more parallel segments that can be navigated independently. Take, for instance, two tab groups. If you navigate one group, it shouldn't affect the other. And when you navigate backwards and forwards, it should remember the combination of those tab groups. And in a similar fashion, sometimes you might want to intercept a route from within another part of your application. Take, for instance, an image post that appears as its own page, but then you can intercept it and then present it in line as a model from a profile or from a feed. In this case, the URL should be respected. And if you were to link to the page, it should load the correct image and not the content behind it. So I've talked about React, and I've talked about some of the things we're excited about in Next.js. But what does that mean for Prisma? <laughs> 
well, for you as the developer, not much. And I know this might sound a bit anticlimactic, but it's actually a sign of a good architecture because we're able to completely and fundamentally change one side of things without affecting the other. But saying that, let's see how Prisma might fit into this new model. So with suspense and streaming, we might consider breaking up our requests into essential and non-essential. For example, if you want to get something fast on screen, you might want to stream the contents of a blog post first and then stream in the non-essential comments later. With nested layouts, you might want to fetch your e-commerce categories in the menu, in the parent layout, and the individual product info in the nested pages. And with meaningful skeletons, we might pre-render a blog post by fetching the post title and the cover image first, and then the rest of the content. In each one of these cases, React and Next.js will deal with the data fetching and the sequencing. And Prisma is ready to handle the data requirements. So this kind of like fine-ingrained data fetching is exactly why Prisma is so good. Now, I want to conclude today with some thoughts and um, some of my own opinions on my abstractions. On one end of the spectrum, we have databases and we have all the complexities of storing and retrieving data from databases. Just ask any of the speakers here what they do, and you will know that databases are complex. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have browsers and all the complexities of drawing the pixels on screen. And as app developers, it's our job to manage the data flow from our database to our application. We could use raw React to manipulate the DOM. We could use raw SQL to manipulate our data. But if there's anything that we can learn from the success of React over these many years is that there is value in simple and more declarative abstractions that reign in the chaos of, of these underlying languages. And it's not just about the ergonomics of abstractions. It's about benefiting from the immense experience that these teams have and get pulling their updates to your project. So essentially, we have three teams that are working on very specific things. And what we can do is we can let them almost ghost code or ghost write the boring and hard parts of building applications so that we can focus on the fun stuff. So thank you for listening. And I hope that has given you a glimpse of what we're thinking about in XJS. And I think right now it's time for questions. Right. Any questions? Do you have any timeline for all of this, or is it not uh, decided? So it's, we're implementing it right now, so we're building the system. I think there are a couple of hurdles we have to overcome um, first. But the main thing is that we're also working in parallel with React. So we have to account for the changes in React and then think about how to implement those changes in Next.js. Hopefully, though, um, I think that we might have something for developers to try out soon. And if you haven't read the RFC but you want to give feedback, we really would appreciate your feedback as well. Any other questions? All right. Mm -hmm.